Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my name is Otamatan, aka Jay from Kazoku no Takus, and I want to welcome you once again to another anime review. Uh, as most of you know, yesterday, Fate Episode 2 dropped uh, in the Raw. Uh, I watched it then, but I rewatched it today to make sure my translation was correct, and uh, now that I've done that, I'm ready to talk about it. So, yay! Um, <laughs> I'm going to start this off by just letting you all know that Mordred is, is waifu this season. I uh, have always liked that character, to say the least. So, anyways, let's go ahead and get started. So, a lot actually happened this week uh, in Episode 2 that, <laughs> I mean, it blew my mind. Um, so, yeah, it might take a little bit to get through all of this, but we're going to do the best we can to try to make it uh, in a timely resolution and uh, get through everything. So, I'm going to do the best I can here. Here we go. So episode 2 actually starts with showing Jean d'Arc's execution as a witch. Um, on her way, she's being, basically she's shackled, she's being walked up to the cross. Uh, she asks for a cross as she's being led to the stake. Uh, a young crowd girl finally comes up and breaks through the crowd and actually gives her a cross. She offers her body to the Lord and thusly is burned to death. Then it flashes to the present where she's got a huge tattoo on her back uh, that looks pretty badass, honestly. Um... And she's packing her bags in a local city hotel, and she boards a bus reflecting on why she's actually there. At that point, it flashes over, well, that's when the intro song actually plays, which is pretty fantastic, by the way, guys. Um, but then it flashes over after the introduction, uh, after the whole title song and everything like that. It flashes over to the castle of Team Black, uh, where one of the servants makes a, a suggestion that they, uh, they all introduce themselves. They reveal themselves as a Stolfo. One of the Charlemagne's paladins and a writer class servant, and a trap boy, it would appear, oddly enough. Um, gotta love it. Traps in, uh, fate. Pretty good trap, too, you wouldn't have guessed. I mean, I kind of had a feeling because I saw Felix and fate in, uh, RE0, but, uh, you know. Anyways, uh, the next one reveals himself as Shiron, Archer class servant, uh, who those of you who have seen mythology may know as a centaur. Uh, actually, this one is all human, uh, but we'll touch on that a little later. The next one is a female adorned with gold head bindings who refuses to speak, like she basically just grunts. Um, so, Astolfo asks the master directly, to which he responds that her name is actually Frankenstein. Astolfo then names her Fran. I assume at this point she was the Berserker class. Uh, though it wasn't explicitly stated what her class was. Um, Astolfo then asks the Saber class from the first scene in Episode 1, but as he starts to reveal his name, he's stopped by his master short of his introduction, uh, which is nothing new, um, but there's a pretty good plot point that comes up a little later in this review um, that I'll be talking about that uh, that is really... It, it kind of explains why the master made the decision to stop his servant from actually revealing... Uh, his name. Vlad Tepes III stands to address the servants and masters. Apparently he was also summoned, so that's pretty awesome. Already this side's got a fuck ton of, like, really high class servants. Um, the black side officially declares that the war has started. We go back to the graveyard at this point where we last saw Waifu and Sisigo, aka Mordred. Uh, Mordred releases her armor and Sisigo Kairi, which is his full name, pledges as her master. Speaking of the summoning location, Mordred questions if Sisigo was a necromancer, which he confirms before addressing the fact that King Arthur's supposed son was a woman, uh, which enrages Mordred to the point where she points her blade at his throat, telling him to shut up. He agrees not to call her female again, though she is a girl, just to clarify. Um, Mordred reveals that she wants to pull King Arthur's sword from the stone, just as he did. Hint, hint. Because we all know King Arthur actually was not a man, but rather a woman named Saber. Ah, well, name saver now. She's actually, it's funny because mother and daughter are technically in the same world right now. So, kind of interesting to see that going on. Uh, anyways, I'm, I'm getting off, off topic here, so. Yeah, we'll continue. Uh, so switching back to the black team, we actually see Frankenstein, now confirmed to be the Berserker, because she wants, she basically tells her master to call her Berserker, using her noble phantasm. Inside the castle at the same time, Fior Yigmalinia introduces herself to Shiron as his master. Uh, the two have great chemistry and get along well. Always good to see that in uh, Master Servant. Pact. Uh, it's revealed that once the dust has settled on the war between the Clock Tower and Yigmalinia, there will be another Grail War for those left, similar to the one in Fuyuki. 
Worrying for his master, Shiron actually asks if his master can actually fight her own brother, to which she responds in the affirmative, saying she's better than he is. I intend to agree. I, I already like her as a character, so I don't, I don't, I don't really see her as evil. It's, it's kind of hard to tell who's the bad guy here, whether it's Yig Millennia or whether it's actually the Clock Tower. So, because um, both like the Clock Towers, well, we'll get to that later. I'll talk about that after I've covered the events. Uh, in the basement, we see Mr. Trap himself, Ostolfo, uh, more or less getting molested by his master um, before he runs away to go basically check out the city. Yeah, that's pretty much the whole scene there. Moving to the Saber class servant and his master, Saber reveals he has no wish for the Grail. His master is angered by this, mentioning his failings in life. Saber dismisses his claim, saying he was satisfied and his death was necessary. The master then dismisses Saber, telling him to leave. Moving to Vlad Tempest, it's revealed the other heroes on the black side have also acquired, uh, the black side has also acquired, are also noteworthy. Uh, Avris Braun, Kabbalist Scholar and Golem Master is mentioned. In addition, the Saber class servant uh, is revealed to be the Slayer of the Dragon Fafnir named Siegfried, which makes a lot of sense appearance-wise now when you look at like the blonde hair and the build and everything, especially for those of you who have played uh, Soul Calibur. Um, you'll understand what I mean by that. But yeah. Uh, also, the previous servants of and Vlad himself, the third, round out the impressive roster. Uh, Assassin is also finally revealed to be Jack the Ripper, which I'm fucking ecstatic about. Uh, Jack the Ripper is then shown to be a little girl with short white hair, which basically plays into the uh, collection of Wraith story in his legend. For those of you who don't know, um, it was rumored that Jack the Ripper was actually a not a person, but rather a collection of Wraiths of all the small children who were aborted from prostitutes. Um, that formed into him and basically went around killing the prostitutes as a result. Obviously a little more far-fetched than probably what actually happened, but um, hey, that's their story and they're sticking to it. So that is actually where it draws from. I won't go too deep or in-depth into that legend or anything because this is still somewhat of a uh, channel where that is not a possibility to delve too deep into. Uh, it's pretty bloody... Thing. But if you wish to know it, if you wish to know the collection of Wraith Story, you can always just go check it out whenever you want. Uh, it is available for you at your discretion online. I'm sure you can actually look it up and find some information. Though, be forewarned, it is not a pretty tale. Um, at this point, we rotate back to the red side. We see Sisigo finally enter the church and address the priest there. The priest, who's also a master himself, Brazil, reveals himself to be Shiro Kotomine, which took me by surprise. Um, so I'm wondering what his relation to Kira is, because that's pretty interesting that his, well, I don't know what he is to Kira, but Kira Kotomine, as most of you know, is one of the general antagonists of both Zero and Stay Night, uh, as, which Unlimited Blade Works is Stay Night, so no matter which one you choose there, they're pretty well the same. But he is the antagonist of the entire series, basically. He was the big bad of everything. Um... But yeah, so so it's kind of weird now hearing that Shiro Kotomine, and let alone his name is Shiro. So he's got Kotomine, but his name is Shiro. Why is that? Anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll go into that later. Shiro Kotomine um, is revealed to be the master of Assassin of Red, uh, who is revealed to be uh, Semiramis, who is basically Shiro's servant. Uh, the four of them then sit down to discuss the current state of things in the war. They mention that Vlad had been that had Vlad been summoned to Romania, he would have been summoned as a hero and not a vampire. It's an interesting thing to note, as it seems that the summoning location can affect the hero's specifics. Um, it's actually the first time in this series, or any of the Fate series, that I've ever actually heard anything specific like that. For example, Mordred was summoned in a graveyard, but had she been summoned somewhere else, what well, could have happened? Like, um, so it's kind of a curious thing to, to think about when you find out that Vlad could have been summoned in one of two different ways. Anyways, uh, Shiro also mentions that a 15th servant has been summoned and is of a new class. Um, and then the other red heroes are mentioned but unnamed. Uh, the new class is called Ruler Class. It's meant to ensure that the war goes smoothly and maintain balance. And at this point uh, in the in the episode, I was pretty sure it was Jean of Arc. Um, but Sisigo takes his leave saying he'll fight alone. Sisigo and Saber traverse the, street, the streets speaking about the new information until Saber asks for a favor. Returning to the church, Shiro mentions that Sisigo was on his guard the whole time. It's already apparent the red team do not trust each other very much, especially in comparison to the black team. Which is, once again, one of the reasons I'm unsure on who the good guy and the bad guy is here, to be honest with you. The red team, I mean, we obviously know the clock tower has um, a lot of different mages in it and everything like that. And we also know 
I just don't know. I don't understand. Why are you that weary of your teammates? Like, I understand that you're not really an army. You're just a collective of people who got grouped into this. But anyways, so Redcaster makes his entrance, and it's revealed to be Shakespeare himself. He alerts the duo that Spartacus, who is the Red Berserker, was picking a fight with the black team early. Looking back to Sisigo and Mordred, it's revealed the favor was for new clothes. Waifu now adorns her waifu outfit of jeans, short shorts, a red leather jacket, and a bra underneath. Not exactly the most incognito getup, but she does get my thumbs up. <laughs> Furthering the comparison to Kiritsugu, Sisigo draws out the enemy and fights alongside Saber to take out all the homunculi and golems. Fantastic fight. That was one of the best fights I think I've ever seen in a, uh, in a Fate series. Like, uh, Kiritsugu's fights were actually some of my favorites, but actually, like, I, I get the feeling I'm going to see a lot of good ones with Sisigo now. Um... But none of the black servants showed up, unfortunately. You know, you win some, you lose some. They can't be drawn out that easily. Uh, but from a monitor in the Yigmonia HQ, Vlad asks Saber Black if he can defeat Sisko and Mordred, which he responds to, saying he certainly can. Uh, back to the church, a shadowy figure cloaked in gold approaches Shiro from the shadows. The figure is revealed to be Karma, the red team's lancer, or launcher, for those of you who've played the games and stuff. Uh, class servant. Uh, Shiro orders the destruction of the ruler class servant, Jean d'Arc, via Karna. Uh, and, yeah, that's pretty well the last scene of the episode. There are actually no after credit scenes this week or anything like that either, so that's pretty much where it stops. So, yeah, I mean, it was an amazing episode, and it was highly packed. There was a lot of stuff to be seen, a lot of stuff that got done, and a lot of uh, progression that took place. Um, if the first episode was considered to be a little too slow, which I think I did mention it was a little slow, which most episode ones are, this one definitely picked the pace up and turned the amps to 11. Um, so there was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of different hand exchanges, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different things that were absolutely taking place on both the red and black sides. It's showing both sides of the story simultaneously, so that's pretty interesting to see. We've got a lot of unanswered questions that are arising and a lot of answered questions that aren't actually being answered at all, but rather um, being partially answered and creating new questions. So um, it's pretty interesting. We're starting to see all the key players. Right now, the odds are stacked pretty heavily against the red team. I've got to admit, black team's um, collection of servants is, is pretty substantial. Granted, we don't necessarily know much about red team's uh, servants, other than the couple that they've mentioned, so I guess that's a thing. But still, you know, I, I have to worry. Um, as I said, one of the things, like the sheer lack of trust in the clock tower side uh, with red team, it kind of worries me. Cause it's like, why, why are you that untrusting of the people the clock tower has chosen? Why is everybody trying to get ahead on everybody on the red team? Meanwhile, black team's over there, just like, hey. Uh, you got my back, right? And we're like, yeah, well, we got your back. And, you know, like, it just seems really weird that the black team is so intangent and the red team is kind of in shambles, just like, I'll fucking handle it myself. Fuck you guys. Um, obviously, you're with Mordred's master, with Sisigo. I Sisigo is the kind of person that is very much like Kid Itsugu. I mean, entirely like Kid Itsugu. I really like him as a character, even though I know he's probably not the, the actual focal point of the show. Um, I really like Sisigo because of his similarities to Kid Itsugu. And I love Mordred because unlike Saber, she has the balls to say whatever the hell she feels like. Um, she's very, I wouldn't call her Sundere, but she's very in your face. She's, she's a version of Saber that I've always wanted to see. And that's why I said <laughs> that Mordred is waifu. Because I've always liked Saber. I've always, you know, had a, had a deep love for Saber, but now I get to see Saber with a, a version of Saber with a completely different attitude, let alone the fact that it's, you know, King Arthur's son, which is code word for daughter, um, but it's King Arthur's son, daughter, and that, that in itself is pretty amazing, so yeah, I really like the way that the lore heads and everything, um, I'm interested to see, I would like to see actually Arthur meet up with Mordred particularly because there was that huge betrayal that Mordred uh, committed and everything that uh, basically resulted in his expulsion and, and everything like that um, which he's still quite 
quite upset over, as I'm sure you you probably could tell when I mentioned that uh, he pointed a sword at Sissy Go's throat. But yeah. Um, God, that was a fucking great episode, man. Ah, there's just nothing else to say. It was a very, very good episode. It's really solid. It stands on its own. It's got a lot of material. There's a lot of fast-paced motion going on, and it's probably going to be like that for a few episodes until we start seeing some of these bigger fights that'll take two or three episodes. That'll be about the time that we see it divert. The art style is still fantastic, as always. Uh, I honestly don't have a single complaint. I guess there was one complaint now that I, now that I think about it. Uh, that kind of molestation licking scene that was going on in the basement. Like, what the fuck was that? Um, Astolfo was was kind of like laying there with his shirt up and his master was licking his chest. And he's like, ugh, are you done yet? I'm like, the fuck? That, did that actually have to be shown? Does that have a purpose? Like, I'm, I'm confused on that part. But the rest of it, I've got a pretty good handle on, so... I guess we'll just have to see if that plays in some larger role, but my complaint right now is that that scene felt really out of place um, and unimportant, so unless licking his body plays somewhere into the anime at some point or into the plot, I'm going to be pretty upset by that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, in any case, I mean, I'm not saying it was a bad episode, I'm not saying it was a bad scene. That one scene was kind of a detractor for me, but, uh, I mean, other than that, it was a really solid episode. It just seemed kind of pointless, like, maybe, like, fan service -y, I guess you could say. Kind of fan service-ish. But, uh, yeah. Hey, uh, have you guys watched it yet? If you have, you should comment down in the comment section. Oh, damn it, I'm off screen again. Comment down in the comment section, let me know what you thought. Yeah, uh, give this video a like if you liked it. Don't forget to subscribe. We are constantly releasing new videos every single day. We've got a lot coming down the pipe like this. This is going to be an insanely busy week, especially for me. Um, this is only the first of several videos to come. We have one releasing on the 14th that I will leave a surprise. Then, if you guys remember correctly, we have a two-day special for Monogatari Owari Monogatari Season 2 um, <clears throat> on the 12th and 13th. So... Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be quite busy all week. And plus my regular reviews as well, so look forward to those. But in any case, I am Otamatan from Kazoku no Otakus. And by the way, before I do sign off, just to let you guys know, I do give this one a 9 out of 10. It was a very solid episode, very awesome battle scene, a lot of really good scenes and a lot of shit going on. The momentum was pretty much kept up uh, the entire episode, except for the molestation in the basement, which seemed kind of pointless at this point in time. Um, but maybe that'll tie in later. So definitely a 9 out of 10. I really like the episode, and uh, I like where the series is going. Honestly, I think this is going to be another one of my favorites. I really like Zero. I really like uh, Unlimited Blade Works. I even like the original Stay Night. Um, and I get the feeling that I'm going to really like Apocrypha as much uh, as I like those as well. So, In any case, uh, we will, I will continue to review this series as it progresses. I can't wait for episode 3. Hopefully you guys feel the same. Uh, I am Otomaton from Kazoku no Takis, reminding you, if you get bored of your world, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to leave and join ours. Peace, guys.